for posterity. Um, yeah, so I, I will definitely make sure that I, I try and do that. You, we're going to have to do some redrawing, but I'll make sure that it's not burdensome. Um, and as I recall, this test last year, even or maybe it being closed book might have made it faster in some respects because you either know it or you don't for some of this stuff. Um, but I don't believe that there was a ton of people that took the whole two hours. Um, I might be confusing that with with uh, second quarter of OCHEM when it, um, the tests are even even a little bit shorter. Um, but I, I think that a lot of this stuff is going to go pretty quickly. Like number eight is going to be a really fast one, right? It's still it's tricky conceptually, but you're not going to take a whole 12 minutes on number eight because a lot of it is which step is this, which step is that. Um, so, but yeah, definitely be paying attention as you're studying to what, you know, how, what kind of pace you want to, you want to do, um, do on this. Some people it's helpful to even do something like um, set a timer on your phone for 12 minutes. Um, and every time timer goes off on your phone, that's your cue. You're supposed to be skipping, going to the next question. Um, and if you're moving faster than that, that's great. Um, because you're going to be able to get that time back at the end and come back to some of the, the longer questions. But just keep that in mind. If it's 10 parts and every and there's 120 minutes, um, you should be spending about 12 minutes per section. That's a good tip. Um, any other formatting stuff? Any other specific material? Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. I'm and I might have missed it earlier from lecture, but is it? I'm assuming the the term is two hours, and it's just a window that you have just that two hours. Do we need proctorio or anything like that? So no proctorio. Um, I don't like proctorio with the compatibility issues, and it's just too big brother ish. And so so the test instead is just going to be open book. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then any any notes we can just take a picture like we did before and just send them with it. Cool. Yeah, um, as you can use notes, you can use a textbook, um, but don't rely on that too much because if you're if you're planning on looking up the answer at every question or double checking and triple checking for every question, you're going to run out of time. There's going to be enough time pressure that you can't do that and just sort of brute force it with you know taking as much time as possible. Um, that's why it's a two hour time window. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then I do add a 15 minute window onto the end of that. So it's actually 135 minutes, but that's designed to be like your last minute, finish this up and scan it and get it uploaded window. Um, so that that doesn't cut into the time you have for the actual test itself. So you should be like, when you hit 120 minutes, um, you should be, you know, finish up the question you're on and start doing your scanning. Because if you're if you're more than 135 minutes, it won't let you submit and you're going to have to send it to me um, via email, which isn't the end of the world. Um, but if it's more than a minute or two past that window, I, I start docking points so that, and it's not to punish you, it's to make sure everybody's on a level playing field that way. Um, it's not just because I'm feeling mean, just, it's just because if, if somebody goes five minutes over their 135 minute window and somebody else didn't finish because they were abiding by that deadline. That's that's not very fair. So do your best to get it in on that 135 minute. And I, I like I said, I think everybody should be okay. Um, it's one of those things though, where if you if you wanted to, you could spend as much time as you wanted with it being a um, open book test. And that's not the idea here. Get it good enough and move on. Don't perfect everything. Don't perfect everything. Don't perfect everything. Don't, let's, uh, I think it's, it might be Voltaire's. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. In other words, sometimes good enough is good enough. All right. Let's do, I have a million and one windows open right now, so. But luckily, I have my new computer, and it hasn't crashed yet when it comes to me overloading it with stuff. Um, so we drew arrows for, for one of these. Let's let's try another try another draw arrows one here. 
Um, and if you are following along, I guess drawing hexagons is not too tricky at this point. You guys are getting pretty good at hexagons, I'd wager. Um, but the most important part is that you're drawing this section right, the uh, active site. Hang on one second. I'm going to mute this and then we'll start working through it. Give you guys a second. I drew that way too large. Hang on. I'll redraw that a little smaller so I have room. So if we have our first step that's shown here is we've got this molecule and then we've got plus H3O plus. And just leave off the lone pair there for the sake of drawing positive charge. And then so first things first, if we start here and then our next step. The only thing that's different is we added a, a H plus that tells us, and it's also a pretty good clue that one of our reactants is hydronium. Um, if we start with hydronium and then we wind up with almost the same molecule plus an extra hydrogen, <laughs> um, then it's a pretty good clue we're going to have a proton transfer step, right? So just looking at products and reactants, we can recognize that. If we want to know beyond that, we're OK. We're doing review session. Yeah, is it OK if my son is being a little distracting? All right. Um, that doesn't mean you get to keep making things louder and louder, though. Um, so if we're trying to draw the arrows for proton transfer step, remember the proton transfer step had two arrows every time we've seen it, right? Because we, whatever, whatever's acting as the acid has to keep the electrons. And then you need a lone pair that's going to take the proton. So something like that. And like I, like I mentioned before, if you have, if you're going to have those four basic tools that you have to work with plus resonance, you know, know what the basics are for those and like, okay, as soon as you can recognize it's proton transfer, then you can say, okay, what do I need to do to make a new bond, but with a hydrogen and then what is going to happen on the other side of that? Right, so recognizing just from the reactants and the products that it's going to be proton transfer is 
more than half the battle. And then drawing the arrows is just what bonds are breaking, what bonds are being formed. And then I'm just gonna keep going back and forth on the same thing that on the figure that we originally had, it was going in a more of a U shape, but in the interest of using my limited whiteboard space. So now we've got water. <laughs> now he's distracting me. He's making faces at me from sitting on the floor with his Legos. Um, all right, so now if we're looking at the, our products again. We're, we lost a pi bond and we're going to add a water molecule. Yes. So we're breaking the pi bond that was right here and we're going to get an, our lone pair back and I'm going to kind of rearrange it from how it was on the paper. If we're trying to go to, and then we had our new part of the molecule was right there. And then that's an oxygen with three bonds. So that's a positive charge. So if we're trying to get from here to there, we have a pi bond being broken and we're making a new sigma bond which our primary way we had of doing that was a nucleophilic attack, right? And this one, it's gonna look a little bit weird because we wouldn't normally think of this carbon as being a partial positive because it's double bound, but it's a little bit like the carbonyl ones we had earlier with the carbon oxygen double bond. Because that's a carbon attached to nitrogen, it is partial positive. So this is going to be nucleophilic attack. It's just going to be one of those ones where we need to make sure we're not going to draw a carbon with five bonds. So it's, it's a little bit distracting. This is a really complicated looking structure. It's got a lot going on here. So, but you, you need to make sure you're paying attention to, okay, if I'm making a new carbon oxygen bond, I need to make room for that bond. And so the other arrow you would have to draw here would be the pi bond breaking. Right, any questions so far? Ed? I like this textbook for learning mechanisms because when I learned mechanisms, it was very old school approach, which was just on a piece of paper. This is the mechanism for this reaction. And it was very, very much felt like I was just memorizing rather than recognizing patterns. And it was sort of a eureka moment when I realized it was the same patterns over and over again, but I like that this one starts with, with the patterns. Um, because it's limited, there's only four possible steps you can do for each one of these, right? Are you always going to include charges and lone pairs, or are you ever going to throw us to the wolves and make us add them in ourselves? Um, I won't just get rid of the charges. If I draw a structure, it'll have the correct charges on the structure. Um, but when I throw you to the wolves, it'll be without even drawing you any of the structures whatsoever. I'll give you, I'll give you the starting material and your final product and ask you what the mechanism is. And you'll have to come up with the four structures along the way. Um, and we'll get there. It won't start with six step mechanisms. First off, we'll start with one or two step mechanisms that you'll have to draw on your own. Um, but like I said, training wheels. Um, I think they call it in pedagogy, they call that scaffolding. 
give you guys a bunch of tools as you're learning the basics and then we slowly remove the scaffolding from the outside as you get better and better at the framework. I like training wheels better. All right, next step is um, got water as a reactant again. And then we are going to go. And that's our product for this step. All right, in the interest of saving time, I didn't draw lone pairs, but they're still there. So Again, if we recognize oxygen with three bonds and a positive charge, the only thing that's changing between these two, I left off the other hydrogen there. The only thing that's changing between these two is we're going from having a water molecule to it attached to just an OH group attached. So in other words, we're losing a proton, right? From here. So proton transfer step. We're going to keep those electrons on the on the oxygen, but then something has to grab that proton. So why that's why it's can can be convenient to have your lone pair drawn there for the sake of, of drawing your mechanisms. This is, like I said, this is going to be one of those one of those skills where you guys are going to want to practice, um, because it's really easy when I'm standing up here doing it for you. It's really easy to follow the logic, right? But when I give you a, just a blank, you know, set of of reaction steps and you have to draw them yourself, that's a lot harder. Um, remember the key steps: you're showing the electrons moving towards positive charges, right? That's always, that's our fundamental rule for all of these mechanisms. You're showing the electron movement. All right, should we keep going with this? Do you guys wanna, wanna work on some of the other stuff or is this where you're feeling the weakest right now? Is the newest, okay. I'm seeing more nods and then than heads shaking. So I'll give you guys a chance. I'll go back to the screen share for a minute, give you guys a chance to try a few more of these steps. Right now we are at, we just finished uh, this step. So we're starting here at that point. So I'll give you guys a few minutes. I need to get a glass of water anyway. And then we'll come back and we'll keep working at it. Are we at the point where we're working down now, you guys? We're going from that yeah. top right to bottom right, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I right. think so. Cool. And then moving over to the left.
Oops. Sorry. Just trying to get my thing. All right. Next up, to go from this top right structure to the bottom right structure, it's giving us that we have a reactant of hydronium, which is a pretty good hint right there, right? We've got an acid as a reactant, there's a good chance our next step is going to be a proton transfer. And you, hopefully by now you're starting to realize how many of these mechanisms are going to be like proton transfer, and then one thing happens, and then another proton transfer, and then another proton transfer, and then something else happens, and then another proton transfer. There's a ton of that in OCHEM. All right. Why? So if, um, part of it is is because there's a lot of of weak acids around in nature. And there's a lot of weak bases in OCHEM. That, and when you do that, you can wind up kind of sequentially one tiny little step at a time moving towards something that's a lot more stable. Carbon oxygen bonds are more stable than carbon nitrogen bonds. So if you look at the at the where we start here and where we end, we get an extra carbon oxygen double bond. And we and it cost us some carbon nitrogen bonds, but the carbon oxygen bonds we're making are more stable. So it winds up after a one tiny step at a time, this whole process, each one of these steps is an equilibrium step. But we're winding up with at the end of it, it's a each one of these steps is minus five kilojoules per mole. Not that energetically favorable. What when you put six of them together, you get something that's way more stable than what you started with. Um, and that's this is one of the mechanisms of oxidation. This is why things go bad, basically. Why food and, and herbs and stuff go bad. A big chunk of that is not necessarily just the plant cells rotting. It's also um, if you take something like dried cumin and let it sit on your, on your uh, shelf in your pantry for three years, um, it'll eventually be oxidized to the point where you can't taste any of the, the flavor. And it's stuff like this that's happening. It's water getting in and reacting like this, or it's oxygen getting in and reacting um, to make these more stable states. And it happens a little bit at a time. Um, and what may have been your actual question is why do we know we're going forward instead of backwards for any of these steps? Um, is because if we went backwards for any of these steps, we wouldn't be going towards the product. Part of it is somewhat arbitrary. If we started with this mech with this molecule at the bottom, and we were trying to get up to this top molecule, it'd be the same steps in reverse, right? So why do we keep going the direction we're going? Because it gets us closer to the product we're supposed to be getting. It's not to say that there aren't other things happening too. We're just focusing in on one process right now. All right. If we're trying to draw to go from this top right now and continue on, nitrogens that amines that have lone pairs are really good bases. Um, and whether you know that or not, if you're just looking at the reactants and then the product here of this step, you can see that the nitrogen gained an H plus. So that means that our lone pair here is going to get is going to act as a nucleophile towards, towards an, an H plus. So the mechanism arrow might look something like that. If you're using a different color, you can go over lines when you're doing your mechanism arrows if it's convenient. Um, otherwise, you might just have to draw, you know, get creative with the shape of your arrow. And then remember that that means these electrons are staying with the oxygen. What, what would we call this next group? Or next step, really? What, what category would this next step be in? Is that a rearrangement? Kind of. It's it's definitely one that it's everything's happening within the same molecule, so it looks like a rearrangement. 
Um, but if we say a rearrangement, remember our original definition of rearrangement was it, it was a sigma bond moves. After a rearrangement, we have the same number of sigma bonds as before. And in this one, we're definitely breaking a sigma bond, right? Because that nitrogen is no longer attached. So this is one where drawing the arrows might actually be easier than uh, classifying it. Electrophilic attack, right? Uh, it would be, we would normally consider this a leaving group leaves. It's just still staying attached to the molecule. The nitrogen is leaving the, the active part of the, the, we're breaking a sigma bond, right? And so if we have a net loss of a sigma bond, it's a leaving group leaving, even if it's still attached to the molecule, which seems counterintuitive, if not actually contradictory. Um, but that would be the best qualification for it. And then the other piece here, would be if we have if the nitrogen is leaving and taking electrons with it, that would leave the carbon with a with a partially empty valence, right? So the other step to get this carbon oxygen double bond here, so that the carbon doesn't have a partially empty valence, is you have to draw the electrons moving down one of the lone pairs from the oxygen are moving down to the carbon here. So we wind up making this carbon oxygen pi bond. So it, in a lot of ways also, and here's another good way for, for recognizing these, is that a leaving group leaving is gonna look like the exact opposite of a nucleophile attacking. When a nucleophile attacks, like back in this step up here, our, our water attacked that carbon, and then we had to make room for it by moving the lone pair from the nitrogen or moving the pi bond over. This is almost the exact opposite. We're gonna make the pi bond and lose a sigma bond instead of making a sigma bond at losing a pi bond. I think I said that right. I may have reversed that. I may have said the same thing twice. Um, but one of, when a nucleophile attacks, we add a sigma bond. Usually, and that sometimes will be at the expense of a pi bond. A leaving group leaving, we're going to take away, a, we're going to break a sigma bond. And sometimes that means we get to make an extra pi bond. So we're adding a pi bond if the leaving group is leaving. Would that's that's what's happening that, in this one. Uh, any ring structure opening would be a leaving group leaving, or is that too much of a generalization? I think you can say that when you have a ring, a ring opening is usually a leaving group leaves. That's at least a useful generalization. It might, there are probably some cases where it's not exactly accurate to say that, but for now we can say that. And anytime you get a ring forming, that's usually going to be a nucleophilic attack. It's just that the nucleophile is attached to the same molecule already. All right. So how are we doing on that one? Does that, do the arrows make sense? Like I said, this this is going to be one of those those steps where it's almost easier to draw the arrows than it is to put it into one of your four patterns. Um, and it's more important that you're good at drawing the arrows than it is putting them into the right patterns, frankly. It's just the arrows are usually harder. So it's a it's a useful skill to recognize the patterns. Last step. We've got a carbon, carbon oxygen double bond. The oxygen's got a positive charge on it because it's got a hydrogen attached and then it doesn't have a hydrogen attached. So proton transfer, right? Everything looks the same between these two, except we lost an H plus. So our arrows would look like
something like that. Lone pair is grabbing the hydrogen. Oxygen here is holding on to the electrons when the hydrogen leaves. Do you want us to draw our arrow coming off of the hydrogen bond to the oxygen going towards the partial positive charge or can we just draw it going towards the oxygen? Just towards the oxygen is fine. I did that on the board uh, right here um, a second ago anyway. Okay. Um, if it's convenient, it would it makes the most sense to show it draw, going towards the plus charge, but I mean, do what makes sense with how you have it drawn on your paper or how, how I drew it on the paper. Okay. And um, um, do you mind maybe um, just so I can take a picture because mine it's hard because I don't have a printout of this maybe just writing out like what each of these steps are on here. Uh, not at all. Okay. Let's. So first step was proton transfer and I'll write this here in a second um, and screen screen shotting is helpful too um while we're when we're doing this i'm pretty sure that zoom won't block it if you screenshot take a screenshot on your computer um you can just save it that way rather than taking a picture on your phone too um but i you know let me so let's get this written in i'll just add some text text boxes so step one was proton transfer And we had several of those, right? And we had a proton transfer for the third step. And then the fourth step. And then the last step as well. All right, I think that those are all proton transfer steps. Um, and then the ones that were not proton transfer, we had nucleophilic attack. was our second step and leaving group leaves. All right, how are we feeling on these, Olivia? I, I wasn't mean to call to you out. You were just about yeah. to. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. Everybody else, want to try try another one? Or right, let's do the carbocation rearrangement. So. If this is our molecule and we want to know if it will rearrange, there are two possibilities. We can move a hydride or we can move a methyl. And in either case, the only reason we will do that is if we're making something more stable than what we started with. And more stable means we go from primary to secondary or from secondary to tertiary. Um, by moving these charges, right? We're moving up that ladder towards having more carbons around the positive charge. And again, it can be helpful to draw what's attached for both of these. Um, it's only going to be the carbons that are directly next to the charge that we need to worry about. So on one side, we had a methyl and a hydrogen.
And on the other side, we had two hydrogens. It's already secondary. If it was primary, we could see it rearranging to become secondary. If we can move a hydrogen to move a primary, a, a um, charge from the end of a carbon chain to the middle of a carbon chain. But if it's already in the middle of a carbon chain, it's only going to rearrange if we can make it tertiary. And it, in theory, can could move to being another secondary one, but there's no driving force to do that, right? Because we're making something that's just as stable as what we started with. And so we're not going to see that. And generally, because um, this this is all going to happen too fast. If we have a carbon with a positive charge, it's got a partially empty valence, which is unstable enough. It's going to react with something very quickly. So the only time, if we had a way of keeping that positive charge there and letting it get to equilibrium, then we might have a 50-50 shot of where the positive charge ends up. But because this has to happen quickly, the only way we're going to see it happen is if we're going to become more stable. Right, so we're not going to move anything from this side. So that'd be making the same level of stability. Be making the exact same molecule, almost, off by one carbon. Then our choice is we can move, and we should always look for a hydride to move first. Hydrides are smaller, easier to transfer. Right, so in the mechanism step would just look like this. Let me clean up. And so that's what the mechanism step would look like. And the product would be the exact same thing we started with, just with the hydrogen moved over one spot, which means the charge moves over to the tertiary spot. So our new positive charge, should have done that in black for this contrast. Um, our new positive charge is going to be right here because we took the electrons that were in the carbon hydrogen bonds and moved them over to where the positive charge was. And right. why wouldn't that make um, like a double? Oh, I guess you couldn't make a double bond there doing that now. No, because that's a hydrogen. Never mind. But you're onto something there because that, that looks a lot how like how we would show a pi bond being formed. The reason we wouldn't here is because we need something else to take the proton. If we did this with a base present, we can actually have a base take the proton away. If we had, let's say, hydroxide was reacting with it, we could do a proton transfer step instead of a rearrangement. And then it, then you would be making a pi bond, and you'd wind up protonating the hydroxide or whatever your base is instead. So that's, you guys are absolutely on to something when it comes to paying attention to. Um, why is it doing this instead of that? Doesn't mean that the other thing's not going to happen. It just means we're focusing on one thing at a time right now, because that keeps things simple enough to actually wrap your head around some of these concepts. Um, if I really threw you into the deep end here, I, you know, we, you'd be doing well. All five of these possible mechanism steps can happen at any time to anything, and that's technically accurate. It's just that some of them are more favorable than others, and we're looking at one process at a time and kind of ignoring the other products that we could get along the way for the sake of lear learning how these mechanisms work. So when we're drawing this, um, we're not drawing an equilibrium sign. It's just an equal sign or? Uh, just sorry, a, it's just a reaction, reaction arrow. Um, OK. 
So regular reaction error, that's supposed to be straight. Um, and your, your key for whether or not it should be an equilibrium step or not is generally going to be, can it happen backward? And in this case, it's never going to arrange its, unrearrange itself because we made something more stable when we did that, right? So you're never going to go from a tertiary carbocation and have it rearranged to be secondary because that'd be going way uphill in energy. Right. And, it, and again, at this point, I'm going to give you that information. Um, and you guys are, are going to be slowly absorbing that and getting used to what the conventions are and, and how to interpret it. Um, and eventually we'll remove the training wheels and you'll have to show that. Last last aspect of rearrangements there's only one way to make tertiary carbocations more stable if it's already tertiary the only way we could make that positive charge more stable is if it means we can have resonance so if we look at this molecule here this positive charge is stuck over by itself. It's already tertiary, so it's pretty stable. But if we moved a hydrogen over, we could still keep the charge on a tertiary carbon that now also has a pi bond adjacent to it. So not only is it still just as stable due to being tertiary, it's even more stable because it's tertiary with resonance. When the positive charge was over here, there was no resonance because we had this sp3 carbon in the way. But when if we move the hydrogen over, we can get an s. We wind up with a positive charge next to a pi bond, adjacent to a pi bond. Which remember that was one of our resonance patterns we could have. Anytime you've got a charge adjacent to a pi bond, there's resonance that can happen. And resonance is a way of, of stabilizing things because it spreads those electrons out over a bigger area. And before you panic, because that's a new concept and is a little bit tricky and rearrangements in general are tricky, <clears throat> the entire test is not going to be around um, carbocation rearrangement and the resonance of those. Resonance is on there, rearrangements are on there, but this would be like the very last question of the test as far as like how difficult this, one of the trickiest things you guys have seen so far is this rearrangement to get to more resonance. So, and we will get more and more comfortable with that. Let's do some more practice with those. Predict whether each carbocation will undergo rearrangement and what the product would look like.
All right, so for this first one, the best way to approach these is not to just is not necessarily to just try every possibility. It's if you look at the molecule, remember the goal is can we make this more stable? So start by looking at what is your carbocation to begin with, and is it already as stable as it can get, or can the molecule be tweaked to make it more stable? Okay. So in this case, we've got a positive charge on a secondary carbon, already relatively stable. If the charge if it was moved over here, we'd, it would still be secondary, right? So in other words, we wouldn't gain anything by having the charge here. Here we've got a quaternary carbon, which tells us maybe there's something we can do here because if we can rearrange this, maybe we can get a tertiary carbocation. All right, so in this case, we're not just moving a hydrogen, we've got to do a methyl shift. But the reactant is going to look the same by drawing the, the methyl group here. So we're still going to be taking sigma bond electrons and moving them over to the empty orbital on the carbocation. Just in, and then, and it's still the electrons moving, they're just going to drag the carbon with them when they move. Sort of like using a, a rubber band to pull a bowling ball. You could do it, but there's going to be some give behind it while everything sort of catches up. Right. And that's why we can't go any bigger than a methyl. If it's any bigger than a methyl, then the electrons aren't strong enough to bring the, the nuclei with them. So we're just, it's going to look just like a hydride ship, though, which means our product is going to be. I'm going to draw almost everything in the same spot. We shifted one of the methyls over, which means we left the positive charge behind on the carbon that had both of the methyls. So we dragged the methyl over there, and that results in a positive charge on a tertiary carbon instead of a secondary carbon, which makes it a little bit more stable. And you would draw a sing, sorry, a singular arrow from the left to the right. Yeah, we're showing the electrons for that sigma bond moving towards the positive charge. So, sorry, I mean between the two different oh. molecules. Straight okay. arrow, not yeah. equilibrium, not curved. All right, how about the bottom one? Is there anything that can be done with the bottom one? Which was, I'll sh go back and let you guys look at that while I'm redrawing it. Isn't this like your example with resonance? This is like the example of resonance. It's already got resonance, right? We've got a positive charge that's on a tertiary carbon that also can resonate with the benzene ring, which means there's really no way we can make this more stable. So it, at this point, if you recognize that, it's already tertiary and has, and has resonance, there's basically nothing that's going to be able to make this more stable. So we can just say, it's not going to rearrange. If you wanted to look at the possibilities, we do have one hydrogen here. 
we don't have any hydrogens attached to this carbon. So this carbon can't do anything. We can't have anything shift here. We have a hydrogen attached over here. And if, but if we moved it over, we would put a positive charge on a tertiary carbocation, but we would lose all of that resonance. We would no longer have any resonance. So with that in mind, we'd be, we would actually be making it less stable if we did a rearrangement here, not even just like equally stable. So we're really not going to see that happen. This would be a, an example of one where there is no rearrangement that'll happen. Then the last one. So if we're looking at this structure, and again, we're trying to say, is there any way we can make it more stable? It's already a tertiary carbocation. So the only way to make it more stable is if we could have resonance as well. And we do have a pi bond, so there's a possibility for that. So what is that rearrangement going to look like? Move the methyl group up. Exactly. Can we wind up making a molecule that looks like two carbons attached there, still have the pi bond in the same place, and a positive charge is right here. And now all of a sudden, there are two possible resonance structures we can have, which makes it more stable. Blues is getting a little hard to see. All right. How are we feeling on this stuff? Getting there? There's um, our textbook does have a pretty a pretty good um, problem section at the end of each chapter. Um, and right now we are looking at, we're in chapter six, getting into mechanism and talking about kinetics. Um, and so if you look at some of the practice problems, there's some, a bunch that have um, stuff like predict, predict which, uh, which reaction will have a positive or a negative delta S based on how many, how many reactants you start with and how many reactants you end with and things like that. Um, there's also lots of rank, here's a good one. For each of these, rank the three possible carbocations in terms of increasing stability. So three would be the most stable, one would be the least stable out of each of these for A. So A is primary, secondary, tertiary, right? Which means this would be the least stable, second, most stable. I look at that, it even looks like primary, secondary, tertiary, one, two, three. Makes sense, right? How about for B here? These first two choices are both secondary, but the first one has resonance as well. So this is gonna go the exact same way, three, two, one. My primary charge is less stable than a secondary charge, which is less stable than a secondary with resonance.
right? So if, if you're looking for more practice with these, um, use the use the practice problems in the book. Um, if you need to, I'm not sure if any of the, yeah, this one doesn't have any of the solutions in the back. Um, so if you wanna check your answer to any specific problems, um, let me know, and I have I have a copy of the solutions manual, which is just comes loosely in a three ring binder, or and I had to put it in a three ring binder. So I don't have a digital version of this, so I'm not going to just post all of these solutions because I have to scan them all by hand. Um, but if there are so if there are any that you want solutions to, just let me know and I'll cam scan you the relevant pages. Um, I just have not done that for all of chapters one, two, three, four, five, six um, at this point. Maybe I'll get ambitious and do that next year, but probably not. All right, how is uh, how's everybody feeling on this stuff now? You guys wanna take a break and come back in a little bit and do some more? Um, you guys, I need to see some nods there. Everybody ready for a break? I have some questions for the um, the midterm um, practice, but I can ask you those individually. So, unless you need a break. No, I was um, I was going to let everybody have a have a chance to get up and stretch their legs because we've been doing lecture stuff for about an hour now. Um, so, how about we take take uh, five minutes and then come back. And if you don't come back, then I won't be offended if, you get, if you're if you feeling pretty good about it. But if you wanna talk about the practice midterm and go through some of the problems, um, let's come back at quarter till. You got Dash hooked up with some new Legos, man. Oh, he just always has has a few. We anytime Legos go on sale on Amazon or at Target, we get you know get a couple sets and then keep them in the closet um, for when we need to to break some out. But he's just in new Legos right now, so he's just going through and building. That's cool. Seems like he enjoys those. Oh yeah, what's not to like? I used to be a big fan of Lincoln Logs, man. I never got into Legos too much. Yeah, Lincoln Logs were good too. Um, and I, I did. I, I seem to remember doing some combination of the two. I'd build the, I'd build castles out of Lincoln Logs, and then have battles with my Lego guys. <laughs> some, some variation of that. Yeah. I didn't have an, a lot of any one specific type of toy, so they all got mixed together when it was time to play. I used to love that Mancala game with those little yeah. glass beads too at that age. That was a lot of fun. That's a good that's a good one. I might see if we have that in the closet because he might uh, get a kick out of that right now because playing tic-tac-toe is, is, oh, gets a little bit boring. And, uh, and he's not quite good enough at spelling to play hangman reliably. Um, but is, uh, Mancala you think would Valence be fun. would be good enough at uh, counting to play with Dash? Mancala, it's pretty simple, right? She probably could. I think that's a that's a really good recommendation. Um, she's definitely this, the point where she should we should start working with her because she'll start kindergarten next year. Um, but yeah, I'll have to uh, have to look into that. Yeah, it's a fun one. I think as far as uh, stuff I'm feeling a little bit rusty with is probably like interpreting information off that potential energy surface and 
some of like the vocabulary stuff when it comes to like enantiomers, diastereomers, all that kind of stuff too is a little bit shaky. Okay. Practice that. I'll uh, yeah, I'll keep that in mind when we go over when we go over these um, problems. I'll we'll make sure we go those. But let's wait for we'll wait for everybody else real quick to make sure everybody hears that part. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll keep that in mind and make sure I emphasize the the vocab too. We'll go. We can go over diastereomers and stuff too. Right on, man. Did I hear you guys were talking about Lincoln Logs and Legos? Yeah. Did you guys get ever ever get into connects? Oh yeah. That's I like those ones because they they like actually moved more. You can like they started to have the gearing in them a little bit. Like yeah. With, I like I like those ones. Yeah, I uh, I'm trying to think when I built one of those. But yeah, though, I think I was a little bit older. Um, but those were definitely good for for that. As my my son's still at the point where he gets frustrated with stuff with gears because he can't make it. He doesn't quite processing how the gears are working. And so yeah, they yeah. just get frustrating is it's he doesn't like the he calls them the mechanics pieces. <laughs> I don't like the mechanics pieces. <laughs> yeah, it's like an adult toy. I've got these little um, magnets that are called specs. They're like little circular magnets. You like build all kinds of stuff out of those. Those are pretty fun, too. All right, let's uh, go ahead and get the practice test pulled up and we can start going through any questions you guys have on some of that stuff. And Elke, did you have a specific one you wanted to go through? Yeah, yeah, I'm several. Um... Um, yeah, I just kind of like want to double check um, some of the things I, I did just so that I know if I did them correctly or not. Um, 
on two part D, I talked to a couple people and I think there's only um, two loan pairs that, um, uh, blah, 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 that can participate in residence, but I just, I just wanted um, you to validate that thought. So I believe you're right. I'm trying to see if I can get a, a round shape to draw on here. Um, but if not, I'll just use a square. So there's gonna be a lone pair here, a lone pair and a lone pair. And then each of the nitrogens is gonna have a lone pair as well down here. And as far as which of those can, can participate in resonance, it has to be something that's adjacent to a pi bond where the, where the um, nucleus itself does not already have a pi bond. Because remember, only one lone pair per atom can participate in resonance. So for this, carbonyl oxygen here, it's got a pi bond, but neither of these two lone pairs can participate in resonance. They're going to stay localized because that oxygen already has a pi bond. This nitrogen at the top, on the other hand, if you, you could draw a resonance structure, and I'll switch to using the other tool here. Um, if you have this oxygen, this lone pair, um, pi bond move up towards the oxygen, we could have this lone pair move over and get a, a resonance structure that would be stable where you'd have a positive charge on the nitrogen and a negative charge on the oxygen, um, which is you know less than ideal as far as stability goes, but it's still a resonance structure. Um, so that um, nitrogen, the top nitrogen has a lone pair that can participate in resonance. Then I'm just going to get rid of these squares are bothering me. I don't like them. I changed my mind. Um, if we're looking at the other possibilities here, um, would be there's a lone pair here and a lone pair here. This night bottom nitrogen has the same problem that the oxygen had. It already has a pair of electrons participating in resonance as a pi bond which means you can't have another pair of electrons jumping in as well. This nitrogen, the middle one, the tertiary nitrogen, has a lone pair and no pi bonds attached to it. So this lone pair can participate in resonance because we could have something like these electrons move over, these electrons move over, these electrons move down, um, where that would put a something like that, where we're going to wind up putting a positive charge on this top nitrogen and a negative charge on the bottom nitrogen, or something along those lines. We can draw these these electrons moving around um, without breaking any of our rules for resonance. So those would be the only two. Um, lone pairs that can participate in resonance would be. Do you mind if I interject real quick? Not at all. Those two. If you look straight down from that nitrogen, the second nitrogen you said could participate in resonance. If you were to draw another pi bond between the carbon that's straight down going to the left, wouldn't that carbon below the nitrogen have five bonds then? You would, you'd have to be careful with how you, you rearrange these um, in order to not draw a carbon with pi bonds. If, if, there was, if you just straight up added a pi bond, that wouldn't work. But if we were moving these, we would need that to move over, this to move over here. Uh. You need to do, it's not all resonance structures can be drawn with just one arrow. Sometimes you actually have to have to draw a bunch of arrows in a row in order to get to a valid resonance structure. Cool, thank you. All right, and so 
to, to reiterate bullet point here, the TLDR, um, you're looking for lone pairs that are adjacent to a pi bond, but where the atom is not already, doesn't already have a pi bond. If you meet that criteria, it's gonna be delocalized. I need to get that's why it's not working. All right. Any other questions on uh, one and two? Um, also, since I'm not printing these out and you guys aren't, I'm always wary when I'm printing out tests for you guys and you guys are taking them in person, I try to, to make it as few pages as possible because when you get a big stack of papers as your test, that's really intimidating. Um, with you, the fact that most of you are not going to print this out, um, I have, I'm, spreading everything out. So it's going to be like 10 pages, one page for each section for the most part. Um, if you are going to print that out, sorry for the waste of paper, but I'm trying to make sure that you're not too crammed. Um, you can also just print out what the individual pages where it's helpful to have them printed. If you printed out just number 10 or something like that and did the rest on, on binder paper. Uh, I just don't want you to feel like you have to be too crammed with these. Can we go over three? I, um, I'm not sure I got all the resonance structures. Okay. So let's look at, and you know what? I'm going to, Zoom has built-in annotations for when you screen share and they're awful um, because they don't move with the screen and they're hard to use. So I'm actually just going to screenshot this and put it into a blank PowerPoint um, real quick. For the sake of being able to draw the arrows properly. Or at least better. So this is what we're working on for number one. Um, come on now. Now I can't get my thing to go away. Hang on one second. There we go. PowerPoint also has garbage annotation systems, but at least they're more consistent garbage. So I just needed to uh, exit and restart the slide share um, for it to work right so I could get to my pen. All right. If we're looking at this molecule, key here is pay attention to the charge there. That's a negative. So this carbon has a lone pair, basically. It's not explicitly written as a lone pair. Um, which, but that means we're going to be drawing the arrows are going to be coming from the negative charge towards the adjacent atoms, not the other way around. So we could have a resonance structure that looked like that for the result of these, which would put a negative charge. You'd have a negative charge on the oxygen at the top. And then everything else would still be right where it was. So that'd be one possibility. If we did the exact same thing going the other direction with the nitrogen, that would be another possibility, right? So we could do I'm feeling more charitable towards PowerPoint. Its annotations aren't garbage, they're just hard to use. I was being unfair to Microsoft. So this one is gonna look something very similar to our resonance structure on the other side, just flipped.
And for this one, that's probably it, right? We only have two pi bonds. There's not really any other way we could arrange these electrons that doesn't have too many electrons on one of the atoms. Um, as far as ranking them, it's actually kind of nice and convenient. We have a resonance structure with a negative charge on the carbon, resonance structure with a negative charge on the nitrogen, and resonance structure with a negative charge on our oxygen. All in all of these cases, everything has a full valence. So the only other criteria is, are we putting the negative charge on the more electronegative element? So we just rank these according to their electronegativity. This one would be the most stable. Then the negative charge on the nitrogen and the least stable or the least significant contributor would be the negative charge on the carbon. All right, and again, I'll, I'll reiterate, um, the most important thing is to fill all the valences if possible. If you can't fill all the valences, now we're talking about having a carbocation situation where we're going to have our rules for carbocation stability. If we if they all have a full valence, then we go to that tie, that tiebreaker of what puts the negative charge on the more electronegative element. All right. So the second one is the one that had more more. Um, resonance structure. So that's probably one that is going to be more important that we go through in a sign. So for this structure, there's no charges drawn immediately. So it's a little bit tricky to know how we should do this. Um, but remember one of the ways we can have a resonance structure is anytime you've got a, a uh, negative, a partial negative and a partial positive with a pi bond, there's the, there's the potential for that um, for that pi bond to just turn into a negative charge on the oxygen and a positive charge on the carbon, which is, we'd usually consider that to be a pretty small contributor because we wind up emptying one of the orbitals, part of the orbital of the carbon to do that. But that is a potential resonance structure. It would look like something like that. That's a positive charge, you can't tell. And this one with hexagons are trickier to draw on, uh, on PowerPoint. So I'll probably, I'll switch to doing this one on the um, whiteboard here. in a second once you write everything down. Right, so here's our first contributor. If I'm drawing the arrows, the first one will just look like that. And this, this is only really a possibility where this is gonna be really, really improbable or really insignificant contributor under most circumstances, except for the fact we have these other two bonds here. They can basically take turns filling in that that positive there, moving that positive charge around to make it more stable. If it was just a carbonyl, just a carbon oxygen double bond, we wouldn't really say that it has any resonance, despite the fact we could draw the same arrow this way. Um, it's only the fact that now, once we have that positive charge there, we have a resonance structure 
that would look like this. And that puts a positive charge here. And then we can do it one more time. Right, so there are four possibilities here. We've got the one with no formal charges. Then we've got the one where you have a plus and a negative right next to each other, which is going to be pretty is going to be pretty insignificant when we're trying to rank these. For always for these resonance structures, we're going to rank them according to how stable they are as they're drawn. This one's going to be the most stable because it has no charges and everything has a full valence. So the molecule that you started with is going to be the most significant resonance structure. Sorry, Sean, before you start um, numbering them, I maybe I'm just totally off, but I thought um, I thought that maybe I could move, I could take one of the bonds on the ox, one of the double bonds on the oxygen and pull it into the ring. May, and how did I do that? Oh, um, how did I do that? Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I could show you what I did, but. So probably what you did is you drew, if you drew your arrows exactly opposite mm -hmm. on the first one, if you drew the arrows coming down, you would have a positive charge on the oxygen and a negative on the carbon. Yeah, yeah. Which then you could resonate those around, but carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. So we have to choose which way this is going to happen, which way this pi bond is going to break, it's always going to be towards giving the oxygen the electrons, never towards giving carbon the electrons. OK, but if we did do that, then would that just make it the least significant? Or is that just uh, it would make so it even, even less significant and it'd be, it would be so insignificant that you wouldn't even need to draw it to answer the question <laughs> completely. But it's it's if you followed our rules, then I, actually, I think I think if you double check, there was a rule that said um, that if you're breaking a pi bond to make a plus and a negative, mm -hmm. the plus always has to go towards the less electronegative side. So okay. basically, because otherwise, basically, you want to get twice as many possibilities for every single one of these, and that just gets to be too many. Okay, I'm just like. I'm just thinking like then when I'm taking the exam, how am I going to know not to do that? Because it's just, it just seemed really natural to me for some reason to do that. I don't um, know. Maybe it's like because that putting, putting electrons towards a ring structure has been something we've been doing in, mm -hmm. in some of our other steps, right? Because trying to make it look like benzene, mm -hmm. which you know is stable. Yeah. Um, but if, you, if it's a carbon oxygen double bond, you we're just just remember that you're you're never going to take the electrons away from the oxygen. Okay. You can make the oxygen share more than it wants to, but you're never going to full on give an oxygen a negative or an empty spot in its p orbital. Okay. The way you can with carbon. Okay. And but that's that's a relevant question too because that ties to the rest of these, right? Like you said, that would that just be the least significant? Yeah, it would be so insignificant that we wouldn't even bother with it normally. But it's not wrong to say that that could happen. Um, and so that's the same approach we're going to take for the rest of these when it comes to ranking these. Um, is which one is going to be the most stable? Is going to be the one that has where everything has a full valence, and you have the fewest formal charges or all of as many formal charges at zero as possible, which would be the one we started with. From there, if we're looking at these three, 
and comparing them to each other, um, they're all going to be similar in that they all have a carbocation, right? They all have one plus and one negative charge. And the plus charge is on a carbon for all three of them. But what, what did we just learn with carbocation stability? What's the most stable type of uh, positive charge? Tertiary. Tertiary. So for one of these, two of these have a positive charge on a secondary carbon. But this one has a positive charge on a tertiary carbon, which is going to make this one just a little bit more stable than these other two. And then now we're really down to splitting hairs because these are both secondary. They both have the same number of formal charges. They both have, um, everything else is pretty much the same. When we're down to splitting hairs, to really splitting hairs, you could say that these were about the same amount of significance. Um, and that would, I would probably give full credit on that for, for an absolute 10 out of 10, or a guaranteed 10 out of 10, maybe even with a half a point extra credit, because I will do that on OCHEM tests if you do a really good job explaining things, um, would be to say, well, this one keeps the positive and the negative furthest apart from each other. So this one's going to be a little bit more stable than that one. So this would be our least stable. That would be our second or our, our third choice. And like I said, if you put three and four as being approximately the same level of stability, um, that wouldn't be wrong because they're going to be really close to the same level of it, um, same energies. Um, so the um, resonance structure two that you said is least stable, wouldn't uh, that one? Yeah. Um, wouldn't we could, wouldn't consider that a tertiary carbon? No. So I'm glad you asked. If okay. it's, a, we're only counting how many other carbons are attached to it. Not, if it's anything besides a carbon, that doesn't apply. Okay, so the, the, that is only in regards ever to carbon. It wouldn't be like if we had a whole bunch of oxygens in a circle. Yeah, we wouldn't call that a secondary oxygen. Okay. Um, we, if we had, if you had an oxygen in a ring structure with carbons on either side of it, we, we have a name for that, we just call it an ether as opposed to being, if it's an OH group, we call it an alcohol. Um, the only other time you will see primary, secondary, tertiary use is with amines, but we always follow it up with amine. A tertiary amine has three carbons attached to a nitrogen. All right, but for- Or amino for, acids, right? Polypeptides. <laughs> no, remember that's, that? You're thinking, you're thinking of, um, of layers of protein structure, protein mm -hmm. folding, right? Mm -hmm. you your primary structure and then your secondary structure. So we do use that same term there, but right. yeah, no, that means yeah. something different. Yeah. That's a good call. I'm glad you remember that though, because protein folding is interesting. Yeah, that was the only reason I remembered quaternary in lectures because of the protein folding. That's right, that's right. Quaternary structure in proteins is when you had more than one polypeptide interacting with other polypeptides, interacting together to make a single coherent protein. All right. Um, any, everybody feeling okay on nomenclature stuff? Um, I, that's, at this point, that's one of our, our easiest to really get your head wrapped around because it's got de definite rules, right? There's no wiggle room on the most of those. Um, I will just remind you when it, you're looking for R versus S or cis versus trans, if it's got an internal mirror plane, then you're not going to have R versus S necessarily, because that would be the meso compound. And in this case, it really doesn't make a difference because you have two identical substituents attached to the two carbons that you might think that you have um, stereochemistry here. 
because if you go around the ring, the top side, it's going to be the exact same as if you go around the ring, the bottom side. Right? It'd be identical. You wouldn't be able to tell which way was which. You couldn't tell those two things apart from each other. I'm sorry. What are you talking about? Oh, sorry. I'm not screen sharing. Thank you. Um, if you're looking at this uh, cyclohexane with the two bromines on it. Because the top way around the ring is the same as the bottom way around the ring. It's both for both cases, it's two carbons and then a bromine, and then you're into the same thing on the other side. And if you go all the way around and come back to where you started, if you tried to assign priority for going the top way versus the bottom way, you're never going to be able to do that, right? Because everything's identical. So, but what you do have is cis versus trains. So despite the fact we learned R and S after that, and we probably spent more time on that, on R versus S, cis and trans should be your first thought when it comes to ring structures. Sometimes there will be cis, cis trans and R versus S, but usually you can just pick one and go with it. Um, and in this case, just be paying attention. If it's got a mirror plane, it's not R versus S. Was that I, R versus S, or no? Um, have to draw the, oh, so for part A? So if you, if it's not, if it doesn't show you, um, and actually I'm remembering this from last year, um, I did give you one that has an asymmetric carbon. This carbon right here that the cursor's on um, has four different things attached to it. You've got a methyl, an isopropyl, the rest of the molecule, and then a hydrogen. So technically that's an asymmetric center. But if I don't give you enough information to tell if it's R versus S, if I draw it as being flat, um, then ignore that because you don't have enough information to do it. But yes, there should have been an R versus S component there based on how many different things are attached. And for this one down here too. Maybe this one too. So there's three asymmetric centers there. That has a tendency to happen when I draw complicated alkanes where I'm trying to get you to, to do things like use the parentheses for methyl ethyl and stuff like that. Um, I occasionally will do that, but thanks for reminding me. I'll make sure that I didn't do that on your guys' test this, this year. Um, and again, if you do see something like that and you don't think you have enough information to do R versus S, you can just write a note. I think there's an asymmetric center in here, but I don't, I don't know if it's R versus S. And at least that way, if, if you were supposed to name it, I can still give you most of the credit for it because you at least recognize it was supposed to be there. And if I screwed up, then no points off at all. That makes sense. I see something coming in and going out, maybe think R versus S. Yeah. Olivia? Yeah, so would that one be, that one doesn't have to have a methyl ethyl in it, right? Wouldn't, couldn't you name it? Couldn't you pick the chain? So I went a different way. I did, yeah, instead of doing that one, yeah, yeah, and then to the right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, if you go that way, you can get. I got two, three, five trimethyl for propyl heptane. Yeah. Okay. That's going to be your best way to do that. If you didn't catch that one and you, you could have named it with an isopropyl in there instead, um, which again, the biggest issue when you guys are writing your own names is that nobody could ever misinterpret your name and draw the wrong molecule. Um, and so, and make sure that you get the longest carbon chain possible. So if there's more than one way to do it, um, you have some leeway with that. And like we said, that would be uh, two, three, two, three, five trimethyl for propyl heptane. Um, and, and again, you might even consider doing the going from the name to the structure first to remind yourself of all the rules so you don't forget a little detail because I'm going to try to give you complicated ones that make you 
remember all the rules, right? Um, so if you start from the ones that I give you here, remember, okay, that's that's how the parentheses should look. Or um, yeah, the oh yeah, if it's dimethyl, I do need to have two numbers in front of it, in front of it. All those sort of rules. It's not a bad idea to do these ones first to remind yourself. Any other questions on nomenclature? What was uh, the bromine one? So this would be trans 1,4-dibromo cyclohexane. OK, cool. Um, I think you guys are getting pretty good at compromise after that last assignment. We're at least working on it, right? Um, and actually, no. Um, can we go over six? Yes. Um, and for five, it may have made more sense if you realized that was supposed to be Newman instead of Neiman. Um, but typos happen. All right, for number six. Draw both chair confirmations of the compound below and indicate which one's lower in energy. And remember that the chair comp that there's really only two possibilities, but we we can put the substituents wherever we want to when we're drawing this to make it convenient. Um, and so start by drawing drawing your chair out get everything arranged properly. And you might even want to draw your axial versus equatorial. Um, and we have have a trimethyl where we're alternating carbons. Two of them are on the same side, and the third one is on the opposite side. So if we pick this, the headrest to be carbon one, um, and let's say that that's the carbon that's at the top of the figure, the way it's drawn. So that we're going to have a methyl that's sticking above the ring from this on this carbon and remember our two possibilities for the carbon the headrest and the footrest are both in, are both in the plane of the board up straight up and straight over basically or close to so if we're trying to say that this is going to be carbon one this is is going to have the um, the methyl group at the top of the figure and we want it to stick above the ring structure when we flatten it out. We're going to say our first methyl is in that position. Sean, do you always start there just out of convenience? Out of convenience, yeah. It's helpful to have a routine. And at least for me, it's easier to picture axial and equatorial and above the ring and below the ring for the, the headrest and the footrest, and then work the middle four carbons around what those look like. Yeah, um, same for me. Yeah, that, yeah it's, that's how I would recommend doing it, but there's no reason why it has to be that way. It's just convenient. Um, if we're looking at the other two methyl groups now, we're gonna have one of them is gonna be on the, it's gonna be these two carbons. One has to be above the ring when it flattens out, and one has to be below the ring when it flattens out. So our two possible places for this front one are going to be straight up and down, or coming towards us. And then in the back, it's going to be going away from us, or and also straight up and down. Right. So now the question is, how do we position these 
so that two of them are on the same side and one of them is on the opposite side of the ring when it comes to being the ring being flattened out. So if this one was above the ring, then again, it may be helpful to leave that, that other position there while you're thinking about it. If we flattened out the headrest, if we reclined it, this would still be sticking slightly up above the ring. And the one that was sticking straight this way is now going to be, would be facing below the ring. Right, so above the ring, above the ring. So we can put our second methyl group here. And then our last methyl group, we want to be below the ring if it flattened out, which would be in the that equatorial position on the back carbon. And then if you wanted to clean it up so you could see what was going on a little bit better, you can. Can I chime in, Sean? Yes, please. So when I was kind of figuring out how to draw these, it was easier for me to imagine the, the axial and the equatorial positions going up and down. Does that make sense? So up and down are always going to be the axial ones, right? Well, like, for example, for your for the first methyl group that you drew, I would have like, instead of imagining the equatorial position in the same plane, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would envision it like that. And that's, that's totally fine because really these things are 109 degrees. These are all tetrahedral carbons, right? Sure. So out of convenience and, and habit, I draw them more like it's a 90 degree when I first draw them. Yeah, but it's yeah. really, this is actually a little bit more accurate to okay. draw it that way. And that makes it more obvious that when you think about being above the ring or below the ring, you're absolutely right. Okay. And it, and the only reason I bring it up is like, it, is it okay to draw it like that without drawing the wedges in your skeleton? Like we wouldn't be marked off of that? No. You know, right. if you, if you really wanted to, at least, you know, at least for the first one to be able to visualize it, if you wanted to add in the wedges and kind of make it nice and the front part be nice and, and thick um, for the sake of giving it some perspective, it's not a bad idea. Okay. I haven't been doing that and my drawings are already. No, I'm not going to grade you down shitty. if you don't do that, but it just okay. it makes it more obvious what the 3D structure looks like a little, which can be really helpful. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And if we wanted to do the other chair conformer, in order to make sure you don't mix things up, start from the one that you draw first and just do a, and do a ring flip. Take this side and flip it all the way down, which would look like, let's see, then we're gonna have When it goes through the ring flip, it's going to look like this now. Everything's going to be flipped. These two that were, I think it also kind of helps with the uh, 109 degrees. I can't make my hands go 109 degrees. So it's more like a right angle when I try to do that. Um, when I do, when you do flip this down though, you're going to wind up with the empty one or the, the spot that has the hydrogen is now going to be pointed downward. And the methyl is going to be in the equatorial spot. This front carbon, once we go through that, that ring flip, when we take the foot rest and rotate it all the way up, that's going to take that, that methyl and it's going to switch from being the axial to being equatorial. 
which is now, so it's now in the position where it's coming out towards us. Sorry, that's axial or? It, it no, it's axial here. Okay, now it's equatorial, okay. And now it's equatorial. So, okay, this is kind of repeating John's last question, but I was initially drawing them with like wedges and dashes and I found that really confusing when I would do the ring flip. And so then I started drawing them, like I have that same situation going on, uh, but I don't have a wedge. I just have like an angular straight line coming out. Well, it's yeah. very clearly equatorial. That's fine. Cool, okay. Um, sometimes the wedges can be helpful for showing perspective, for helping people visualize it. And sometimes it makes things more complicated. Um, and so whatever works for you. And these, these four positions, the armrests, are the trickiest to visualize how they switch from being axial to equatorial. Um, but if you have, let me see if I can arrange this so that, oh uh, yeah, so if we have, think of the, the orange one as being, Let's see if I can, being in the um, axial position to start, or sorry, equatorial position, because it's coming away from this. If I take this, this end and make it go through a ring flip, it rotates everything else that's attached by switching which end the headrest, if, it, if it's sticking up or down, that rotates what's attached to that carbon that's close to you. Right, so it's a little bit with the, the headrest and the footrest, it's easy to see how it goes from axial, axial to equatorial and back. It's a little bit harder to visualize with the armrest ones, but it's because you have to remember that those carbons, the bonds around those carbons are going to rotate to stay away from the other bonds to stay in that tetrahedral shape. And that winds up pushing them from being axial to equatorial or vice versa. Sean, for that um, methyl group on the right, on the, yep, yeah, on the left, that one in the equatorial position, can you just draw that like coming out to your left? And yeah, yeah and, and just down a little bit. Yeah, so if you draw one, your equatorial position is being basically straight down there, then your, your equatorial. You mean Sorry, your axial, thank you. Your, yeah. your equatorial is going to be more like that. And yeah, you don't need to do the wedges. Um, again, it's just the way that my brain works. And I'm trying to show as much detail as I can. So you think of these as not just being a drawing on a piece of paper. Um, I think, sorry, I think I opened the can of worms with the wedges <laughs> when you no, covered it no, no, initially. No, no, that's, that's how I, I think, because I've been doing this long enough that when I see this, it actually does convey a fair bit of, of information to me and help me visualize it in 3D, but that's just because I'm so used to these drawing things like this. Um, and so I, I forget that doesn't, isn't helpful for everybody. Um, yes, drawing it just the other direction here is both faster and also acceptable. So that means so that was our uh, methyl there. And our last one that was equatorial is now axial on this carbon, which means it's sticking straight down on that back carbon. And again, to visualize it, it might be helpful. You might pick and choose where you want to do your wedges, or that it might be helpful for you to draw the wedges on the on the um, cyclohexane structure and not on your substituents, just for the sake of emphasizing that shape. That might be helpful without putting the dots and wedges on the substituents, and that's fine too. I'm kind of confused um, just 
taking a worm out of the can um, <laughs> to jump on John's analogy. But um, okay, so the, the methyl group that's pointing um, on your right drawing there, that far left methyl group, that one that you go up, about, right? Yeah, wouldn't it be going up? Because if I think about flattening out that structure, then it's also pointing down and the axial is pointing down. And so then I think, well, everything's just pointing away from me if I'm looking at it from well, above. I'm going to, I'm going to erase this backward, this back one, just for the sake of not making it look too crowded. Um, if we think about where the two, the two things are that are attached to this front carbon, if our choice is, is axial versus equatorial, the axial that's pointed straight, that's pointed straight down away from everything else, or even more accurately, might be a little bit more like, like that shape. Um, it's still going to be in the same plane as this carbon right here. And so when we, if we flattened this out, if we have to pick what's above the ring and what's below the ring, it's gonna, it's kind of like when it switches from axial to equatorial. Um, Let's see, get this set up in a way we can see it visually. Uh, make, try to make it look, the molecular look as best we can like that one. That's pretty close. It's also tough because my screen has it mirrored, which makes it really hard for me to. All right, so the green and the orange are on are this carbon, are on that carbon, right? So when I take this and flatten it out, so yes, the green is almost eclipsing this, the headrest carbon now. And if I flatten it out though, everything winds up sort of shifting around so that the green is above the ring. So it's, it's the act of flattening it that makes it take that, that structure and be above, even though they're, it's kind of drawn away from everything else. And if we're being as, as accurate as possible, it really should be more like in the same direction because this bond is going backward. This one bond is gonna be coming towards us. Yeah, that's what I meant by up. I guess I'm seeing, yeah. I don't know if we're talking about the same plane because like the, rectangle in the middle if you can kind of envision that or like oh, inside yeah. the ring yeah that for that's me cool. that's like the plane that's the plane and i'm always kind of talking about up above that or below that that's that's not a bad way to to think about it it's just um if you can consider that to be the flat part when you take the headrest here and put it down there's gotta be something above and something below. And if these are our two choices for what's gonna be above and what's gonna be below, there has to be one that's up and one that's down just based on the geometry. And so the one that's already closest to being up is the one that's gonna be above the ring when it gets flattened out. It's Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say too. So is that's the more technical way to draw it. Right, or is yeah. would that be more of a way for someone who's a beginner to draw it? I don't know. This is, no, this would definitely be the most accurate way to do it. Um, it's it's also the way a beginner would draw it because you're trying, you're still getting used to how to visualize these things. The more comfortable you get seeing this in your head from the drawings, the less likely you are to take the time to do that. You're just going to point it wherever you can so that it's not getting in the way. You're just going to point it away from everything else so that you have room. Yeah, it's so weird that maybe we just didn't start off drawing all of them that way. Maybe for next next time. Yeah, um, definitely. We'll take that. We'll take that into account. Yeah. Um, and that that's definitely a possibility. If you look at the drawings that are in, in especially older textbooks where they didn't have computers that were as good at making figures, it wouldn't have any of this shown. It would just be you would have that, and then you would have this drawn to all of them. 
which is sort of the way I, I guess I started it. So, and they wouldn't even be able to do this. They would just have them drawn on top of each other. Um, so that's- I, that's, I thought that was confusing. <laughs> It, it definitely is now that I look at it. If it started from here and then progressed to this, that would probably make more sense um, rather than just jumping straight from drawing it as being flat hexagon to this. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Sean, um, can I ask you a question about this that's related to our lab? Yes, absolutely. Um, so when you're looking for the most stable conformer, if for example, for like a 1,3 dimethyl cyclohexane, um, both the cis and the trans forms will get you to a conformer where you get the substituents equatorial. Um, I believe that one of, in, for all of the dimethyl cases, one of them has has no conformers favored because no matter which way you draw it, you get one axial, one equatorial. But for each of them, there should also be one stereoisomer where that allows you to put both of them equatorial. So when you're saying for cis and trans, neither one of them has a favored. One of them is gonna be able to, you're gonna be able to put both of the methyls equatorial. Well, for the one three, I'm getting, maybe I did this wrong, but I'm getting that. Um, so when I start with the cis, they're both, uh, they're both axial on the same side. And so when they go, they both go equatorial. And then for the trans, since it's one and three, I have them on opposite sides and they're both axial. Right. So that's that's where I think where you where you made a mistake because if they're one and three and they're trans, yeah. Because so this is this is that molecule, right? This is one and one. Oh, three, you're you're six. totally right. Yeah. So if it's if it's one and three, then and it's trans, then one should be axial, and the other one should be equatorial. Bingo. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Thank you. There you go, which, me, which would make the cis the more stable isomer, and this would be the most stable conformer of the cis, would be the one with their, where they're both equatorial. Um, and then to finish up where we were on this one, that was the trimethyl. We would have uh, let's see, this is going to go roughly that way. Now I'm trying to be very careful to make them as accurate when it comes to angles as possible. Um, we would have something that looks like this, where this is a bond that's going that's on that back carbon that's going in the axial position. So when we have this set up, we have, we can have two methyls in the axial position in one equatorial or we can have two equatorial and one axial. So the most stable comp, we have to have one axial, but that would mean that the most stable of these two conformers would be the one on the right. All right, and so I'm the way that I write, I'm going to write this question for the test. It's going to be written the same exact way. I'm just going to take it and switch where the substituents are, whether they're cis or trans. Um, maybe make one of them bigger than the others. If I had had a um, an isopropyl group instead of a methyl in one of these positions, um, then the way that make it more stable would be to put the make sure that the isopropyl was equatorial. If it was a dye substituted and they weren't all the same size, if you have to choose one equatorial and one axial, you have to put the biggest one has got to be equatorial. Right, just to extend from what we learned from the T-butyl on, on the lab, 
was it's more important for the biggest groups to be equatorial if you have to choose. Best option would still be if everything can be equatorial, but if the isomer I give you that's not possible, then you pick whatever's going to have the biggest group equatorial. That would just be one, one way I could tweak this. I could also just take this and make it try substituted again, just on different carbons or something like that. It's, um, but it's going to be the same concepts every time. Draw your two complements, figure out what's going to have the fewest clashes. How are we doing? Um, when you say like biggest um, molecule or whatever, it's, are you always, it's not always gonna be a methyl group, so you might do some other type of group. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna pick it, pick it carefully so that I, I don't put you in a position where you have to judge something that you don't have much experience with. Like if I did this one, except the, um, the methyl that was by itself was bigger than the other two, then you've got two things that are competing. You can either have two, the two small groups, both equatorial, or you can have the big group equatorial. And you guys don't have the experience to be able to do that on the fly. So I'm not gonna give you one like that. If I give you one where you have to choose between the two sides, it would be if it was like dye substituted and you had to choose between just, just two options, either the methyl or um, a bromo group. Bromines are, are that are bigger. Bromines are bigger. Wh whatever has more electrons is going to be bigger. Okay. More electrons is all means more energy levels. That's a bigger deal than having more carbons around. Usually, I think a bromine is even bigger than a t-butyl group. Um, but and again, I'm going to pick it carefully so that you guys know. To, so it's it's fairly obvious. I'll probably just stick to carbons because you guys can all look at how many carbons there are and decide how big it is. Um, and it's confusing and, and scary when I throw halogens in there. All right, so and, and again, go ahead. And say you ask us between like a cis and a trans form, then you do the same thing, right? You do the confirmations and see yeah. which one can get the biggest molecules for this apart. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's always just going to be about how do I arrange things so that everything is as far apart as possible, which for cyclohexanes means equatorial. Um, and whatever's biggest matters more for those. All right. Any, before I erase my beautifully drawn cyclohexanes here, any other questions on chair compromers? Or should we look at uh, seven and eight? All right. Let's, so normally I would say let's take a little break here, but I think we're close to being done for the night. So rather than take a break, um, and I think seven's going to go pretty quick because that's just reviewing some of the vocab um, when it comes to diastereomers and enantiomers. Um, and I do have office hours tomorrow. If you guys have any more questions, that, um, I know I don't usually see you guys on Wednesdays, but tomorrow from three to four, no, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow's Wednesday. Um, tomorrow from 2.30 to four, I think, I have office hours um, and our normal office hour link will we'll work for that. So if we don't get to the questions you have or if you're burnt out and you're not and hearing it anymore right now, just come by tomorrow. And is tomorrow one of those days where there's a better um, part of your office hours where you're not as busy with your other students? Um, they all just finished a test today. So they're not going to be, or at least by midnight tonight, they're finishing a test. Um, so I, I would not anticipate that there's gonna be a ton of Gen Chem students around. If there are, it's gonna be, you know, the sort of, I messed up on this problem. Can I ask you about it? Questions, which is are usually more rare and easier to answer, faster to answer. So, um, no, for tomorrow, no, it should be pretty, pretty sparse. Um, 
for seven for the stereochemistry, most of what we're going to be looking for is it's going to be multiple choice like this for all of them. Um, because we really only have four options at this point. We can have um, uh, can I say that? Yeah, I think so. So in antiomers are going to be molecules where the mirror image is not the same molecule, um, but it, it needs to be a mirror image if they're going to be in antiomers. If it's a diastereomer, that means that the mirror image is not the same molecule, but it's also not, um, they're, they're not mirror images of each other. If we're looking at the two of these, diastereomers were always going to be used in comparing two molecules to each other. So we're not just saying whether or not it has a superimposable mirror image, we're saying these two molecules are the same, or these two molecules are mirror images that are non-superimposable, or these two molecules um, are not mirror images, but they're also not the same molecule. That's where diastereomer comes in. If they're not mirror images, and they're not constitutional isomers. So in other words, everything's still attached in the same place, but they're also not the same molecule. So that would be like if you took the mirror image and one of the stereo centers was flipped, but not the other one. So, and would you look at that? I is a really good example or, or lowercase one. I'm not even sure how you would say that bullet point in, in uh, verbally. Um, this one, if we look at these two, we've got the, the top two methyls are, they're all, it's all one, two, three, or one, two, one, two, four, five would be our methyls, right? Our methyls are on carbons one, two, and then four and five. So they're not constitutional isomers because a constitutional isomer would be one of the methyls is not on the same carbon on the other molecule. So if it was one, two, three, five tetramethyl, that would be a constitutional isomer, or if two of the methyls were on the same carbon or something like that. So the fact that our numbering would be the same for both of these tells us it's not a constitutional isomer. If we look at this, so we're, we're down to these other three choices. We can look at this and say that it's definitely not the same molecule as well, right? Because if we look at the, the molecule on the right, the carbons that are the methyl groups that are on opposite corners of the hexagon are cis relative to each other, right? So carbon one and carbon four are cis relative to each other and carbon two and carbon five are cis. And that's not the same over here. On the left-hand side, it's carbon one and carbon five that are cis. It's the top two that are cis and the bottom two that are cis relative to each other. So it's not the same molecule. And it's also not a constitutional isomer. So if our choices are down to enantiomer or diastereomer, we need to look at it and say, okay, if it's an enantiomer, that means every stereocenter gets flipped. And that's not what we see, right? The two that are on the right-hand side stay the same. And the two that are on the left-hand side flip. So it's not an enantiomer. It's not a constitutional isomer. It's not the same molecule. It has to be a diastereomer. And that's sort of the way I would approach diastereomers is they're your last resort. If you can conclusively say one of the others is true, you, then you should, because those are usually easier to prove to yourself. If you can't say one of the others is true, then it's probably a diastereomer. So if it was the same molecule, then for the one on the right, would you have two dotted lines on top and two black lines on the bottom? You could, yeah. And that, that would make them the same, right? Right, that would be the so same. It would be like you're flipping it like a pancake? Exactly. Exactly. It's like if you took the molecule on the left and you flipped it like a pancake vertically, um, you would get 
the two molecules that are below the, the hexagon on the left-hand molecule would be above the hexagon on the right-hand side. And that would be the same molecule. And that would be if it was the same molecule. Just flipped, okay. Yeah. Um, the easier ones, the easiest ones to recognize are usually enantiomers because any stereocenters you have have to be flipped. So for this on the right-hand side, we have our carbon chain is in the same spot on both of them, right? All that's sw switched is that the oxygen that was coming out is now going away from us. And the chlorine that was going away from us is now sticking out. So we flipped both of the stereo centers, which would make it an enantiomer. Is it pretty helpful to think about the stereo center when you're trying to figure this stuff out? Um, unless it's a constitutional isomer, you almost have to. Um, the exception being, yeah, I, if you can if you can manage to flip it around in your head to get if we tried to take this molecule on the left here, and we tried to flip it over to make it look like the one on the right, we couldn't do that, right? We couldn't take that molecule and flip it like a pancake or spin it any way and get it to actually look like the one on the right. Something's going to be backwards no matter what we do. And so, so you're, you definitely do want to be paying attention to that. And that's um, if you have stereo centers that are R versus S in the matter of whether or not they are both flipped or just one of them are flipped or neither of them are flipped is going to be what distinguishes enantiomers from diastereomers from the same molecule, respectively. I think I said cool. that all the right order. Uh, I think so, yeah. And if you have four choices, here's a good piece of test taking strategy. Um, if you have four choices on a test and then you have four questions about that, unless it's a very highly regulated standardized test, odds are there's going to be one of these options is going to be for each one of these. If it's a standardized test, they do it all by ran it's all random anyway, so you can't rely on that. But if it's a test somebody like me is writing, um, there's probably going to be one example of each of these down here. So you can't officially use process of elimination, but you can use that to sort of you know, nudge you one way or the other on some of these. So if we know one is diastereomer and two is an antiomer, we probably have one that's the same molecule and one that's a constitutional isomer at the bottom. Um, but without knowing that, even not taking that for granted, um, if we look at four, four should be a really easy one when we look at it. This is what I mean about them all just being lined in random directions. This is the standard way of drawing cyclohexane chairs. Um, is just like this with no structure to it at all. Um, which when your eye is trained, you can still see the 3D structure to it, but it does take practice. If we're looking at these two, that should seem like it's really obvious. Because what's different between the two? The arrangement. The arrangement meaning? Um, so you have your uh, methyl groups on different. So like this would be, the one on the left would be a like a 1,2 cyclohexane. And the other one would be a 1,3. Bingo. Our numbering is different. The methyls are attached to different carbons, which is a dead giveaway. It's a constitutional isomer. Those are gonna be your easiest ones to recognize because the actual atoms have to be attached differently, not just pointing in opposite directions, attached to different carbons. Um, and if you, 
if you are trying to practice assigning cis versus trans to these, the one on the left would be cis, the one on the right would be trans. If you look at where the other, the other atoms would be on each of these, be something like that and something like that. And over here it would be there and something like that. So the one on the left would be cis because when we flatten it out, both of the black lines would be above the, the ring structure. And the one on the right would be trans because our two black lines would be on opposite sides when we flatten it out. One would be sticking above the ring and this one would be below the ring when we flattened it out. And last but not least, when it comes to these, they're drawn differently but we have an isopropyl group in the fourth carbon. If we call this carbon with the methyl, carbon one, we have an isopropyl on carbon four in both of these. We have a pi bond going from carbon one to carbon two. We have a methyl group. Our isopropyl is below the ring on the left-hand side and it's above the ring on the right-hand side. But if we took this molecule on the left, if we took it and grabbed the isopropyl in, our, in your right hand and you grab the methyl in your left hand and twisted, you could flip it around, right? And have it be flipped like a pancake, just flipped vertically this time instead of horizontally. You would get the, ex would you get the same molecule? Yeah, you could see that with the pi bond too, it flips. Right. The pi bond would flip to the other side as well, right? If you're standing on top on the carbon that has the isopropyl and looking across the ring, if the isopropyl is up, the pi bond is on your right. And if you flipped it over, now you'd be standing on the other side of that molecule. So the pi bond would still be on your right. It takes practice to be able to visualize these. And if you really wanted to be sure, you could you could assign R versus S for this asymmetric carbon for both of these options and you'll get the same thing in both cases. You should get R for both of them, I believe. One, uh, no, S for both of them. I had a 50-50 shot, I thought I'd guess. All right, when it comes to assigning R versus S, that's actually got a straightforward procedure to it. Um, so it's a, a little bit more cut and dry than some of these other concepts we're trying to, um, to get the hang of. The trickiest part about these is always gonna be rotating them so that your hydrogen or your lowest priority substituent is facing away from you. But if you remember, think of three of three of the, the substituents as like a fan blade or a propeller and keep the fourth one the same. Um, it's something that I think you guys, it seem, seemed like you guys were doing okay with that when we were doing it in class. So you might just have to remind yourself on some of those. Um, and so I will, I'm going to wait on those. I'm not going to do those right now because I think we have more demand. It's going to be more demand to go through number eight than to do R versus S. If you want to stick around at the end, if we have time before 620, after we go through eight, I'll do R versus S for those. Um, if not, then I'll, um, I'll do them in office hours tomorrow. Um,
All right. This one is going to be the one that last year I think was the trickiest um, for my students, but they also had not had as much, didn't have a full lab on potential energy surfaces like you guys have at this point with K and Delta G. Um, so I think you guys are better prepared for this than they were last year. Um, but I, I could be wrong on that. I frequently overestimate how well my labs make their point. Um, so if we're trying to do the uh, its most basic level, um, one of the things to remember is that transition states are always going to be um, are always going to be maximums, local maximums. And intermediates would be the other way I could mix this up would be to cir say circle all the intermediates. The intermediates would be anything that's that is a, a um, local minimum. So the transition states would be there. The intermediates would be these position one or positions two and three. Right. And so you're never going to have an equilibrium constant for a transition state. Any equilibrium constants you have are going to be between, you can have an equilibrium constant between your reactants and intermediates. You can have an equilibrium constant between one and four reactants and products. You can't have an equilibrium constant for transition states, just a rate constant instead. Um, and if we wanted to look at just qualitatively, which step would you expect to be the slowest is going to be the one with the largest barrier to the transition state. So the transition states determine kinetics, the rates, and the intermediates determine equilibrium constants. And so which step would we expect to be the slowest? Well, one to two, that looks like it's going up like two and a half lines to get to the first transition state. And it's going up one, two, three, four lines to get to the second transition state from the intermediate. And then from three to four it only goes up two. So from two to three would be the slowest step here. What what did you say the slowest would be the one with the largest barrier to what? The largest um, activation energy or the low, the highest transition state energy. Okay, thanks. So to go from two to this second transition state is gonna be a lot higher in energy. That's a jump of four, whatever arbitrary units we're using here. And so going from, two to three is going to be the slowest step. And then for the largest equilibrium constant would be the step that's most downhill in energy from, from an intermediate to the product or from two to three, from the potential minimum, or sorry, from the minimums to the next minimum. So going from one to two is uphill in energy. So K is going to be less than one. Equilibrium is going to favor staying at one. Going from two to three is also going to be uphill in energy. So that's going to have a very small K value, a very small equilibrium constant. Going from three to four is way downhill in energy. So from three to four is going to be the step that's got the highest equilibrium constant because it's the most downhill in energy.
how do we know if it'll be spontaneous? I was using the logic that if your products are lower in energy than the activation energy, then it should be spontaneous. I don't know if that's the right logic or not. You're close. Lo lower in free energy than your reactants, not your transition state. It's always going to be lower than your transition state. But if, if it's spontaneous, then four should be lower in free energy than one, because it has to go downhill in energy, in free energy, for the reaction to be spontaneous at this temperature. Remember, G, free energy, has a temperature dependence in it. So this is at a specific temperature. If we change the temperature, all of this could change. So sorry, was that spontaneous or not? So this would be non-spontaneous because four is higher in energy than one. And then also, um, why wouldn't we circle um, the dip right before four as intermediate? Semantics, I guess. Um, if it's the end of our reaction, then we wouldn't call it an intermediate, it's a product. Okay. Um, Does but the it's same really... go for? Sorry. No, go ahead. Does the same go for one? Because it's not in, an intermediate. It's like not in between anything. It's the beginning. Yeah. Okay. It's you know if you're on a road trip when you um, when you're leaving your house you wouldn't call that a pit stop right? When you're leaving your house that's the start of a road trip not a stopover. But again, it's mathematically and the way they look on the potential energy surface, they're gonna be very similar. They're gonna have similar properties to the intermediates. And so it, it really is semantics. E is gonna be one of those examples where I give you a sign on delta H and delta S and you have to predict what happens when the temperature changes. So if the overall reaction is exothermic, and delta S for the reaction is less than zero. If we decrease the temperature, how is that going to affect the equilibrium constant and the rate? Rate is easy because rate is always uphill in energy from where you start. Um, so rate temperature is all, increased temperature will always make your rate faster. it will not always have the same effect on your equilibrium constant because that's going to depend on delta H and delta S. Wait, sorry, the reaction rate is increased? When, sorry, when, when you increase temperature, the reaction rate is always increased. So a decrease in temperature is the opposite. A decrease in temperature will always slow a reaction down, at least initially. And then for the equilibrium constant, you have we have to remember the form of our, our equation looks like this, right? So if it's exothermic, That means delta H is negative, which means favors spontaneity. If delta S is negative, negative and a negative, non spontaneous, right? Favors non spontaneity. Non spontaneity. So when the temperature decreases, is the reaction going to become more spontaneous or less spontaneous? Less spontaneous because you've already got a delta S value that's below zero, right? Well, so that means that would make this whole this whole second term is favors non-spontaneity, right? As long as it's, the temperature is a low number, yeah. 
So when the temperature gets smaller, this whole term, temperature can't be negative, right? If we're in Kelvin, which means no matter what, this whole second term is always going to favor being non-spontaneous. So when temperature gets smaller though, so we have one that favors being spontaneous, one that favors non-spontaneous, we're making, when the temperature decreases, we're making this side smaller. Which means if this side is getting smaller, the side that favors non-spontaneity is getting smaller. That means the reaction gets more spontaneous. Think about it this way. This is a constant, right? Let's just say it's minus 100. And then we've got minus T times, and let's say that this is um, negative two. If we want delta G to be negative, as long as if temperature gets too big, then, then we'll wind up with this whole second term getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Which means that we're gonna get above zero once temperature gets big enough. When, as long as temperature is small, this whole thing is less than a negative 100, then it's gonna wind up being, delta G will be negative, which means it'll be spontaneous. So low temperature for this reaction with, for any reaction that has these, these signs on delta H and delta S, then a low temperature will mean more spontaneous and a high temperature will be less spontaneous. Sorry, and how do we know that delta H is negative? Because it's or exothermic. Ugh, okay, right. It's a lot of vocab and a lot of layers to wade through on these because that still didn't even answer the final question, right? Final question was equilibrium constant, but we know that that's tied to how spontaneous something is, right? If something is more spontaneous, that means equilibrium constant is bigger. Right, because we have that equation, K equals E to the minus delta G over RT, which, following tracking the negative signs through this whole thing with an exponent with an exponential involved gets to be really tricky but the bigger the more negative delta g the bigger k will be so the more spontaneous means a larger equilibrium constant i got you i think i was incorporating temperature as if delta S was already a positive number. So I'm thinking the bigger the temperature is, the more positive that value is gonna be because delta S is already below zero. You just, yeah. So if I ask you guys a qualitative question like this and, and, and you're having trouble seeing it qualitatively with positives and negatives, you can make up numbers for delta H and delta S as long as they're the right sign and then do two different temperatures and see what happens to delta G. You could do just what I did here, make delta H negative 100 and delta S negative two and plug in 100 for your temperature and then plug in five for your temperature and see what happens. Numerically, that might actually be easier conceptually. You don't have to do that, but it might be easier to see what's going on with the numbers than it is to wade through all of the, well, that's a negative, which means this is really a positive, which means then there's an exponential involved. It gets complicated, I know that. Yeah, so, so it increases? So K would be getting bigger when you okay. decrease the temperature, exactly. So the constant increases. Okay. Exactly, yeah. And I can't think of a set of, off the top of my head, granted I haven't rewritten this problem yet, off the top of my head, I can't think of a um, possible set of, of conditions where 
changing the temperature wouldn't make wouldn't change these. Um, so I don't think that you should be getting a remain the same for any of these, unless I said something like, I guess if delta S was approximately zero, if you had the same amount of entropy before and after, then delta S is gonna be about zero. And in that case, changing the temperature shouldn't affect the rate constant, or sorry, it should not affect the equilibrium constant. That's, that's about the only case I can think of um, where the equilibrium constant will remain approximately the same. All right, that was a good review session. You guys had, we had a lot of good questions there. And now you're probably all spent. Do you guys still want to do five minutes of doing RNS, or you want to anybody who's having issues with it come to uh, can come to office hours tomorrow if you're spent right now? What are we doing um, on Thursday? Taking the test, or use it as more office hours. I'm not going to log on until probably closer to nine than eight. Oh, that's on right. Okay, cool. But you have we don't have anything scheduled so depending yeah. on you know if you've got a really tight schedule or work schedule or whatnot you have that two hours that you're supposed to be in lecture that you could use to take the test okay well then i'll see you there because i'm working a 12-hour shift tomorrow so okay then uh, get your sleep um like i said if i'm not there right at eight um then uh, come back closer to nine and i'll be there sean you're, you're just going to but we can take it whenever